I've always wanted to be a writer. Turns out most writers and other artists can't pay rent or buy groceries, and I wanted to do that even more than writing. I became a teacher because it would provide an income while allowing me to write and be creative in other ways. There are few things that require one to be as creative as finding a way to get 10-year-olds to pay attention. It was also a way to make some difference in the world. Seven years ago, I quit teaching, and I decided to try to become a better writer. I wrote a screenplay after taking Aaron Sorkin's master class. The script wasn't very good, but it helped me hone some of my skills. Four years ago, my nephew's mother suggested I start a blog because my writing was good enough that she thought it should be shared beyond my Facebook page. I didn't know what a blog was, but some friends helped me figure it out. That went well. When I tried to monetize it, a musician friend of mine said I had to stop doing that because I had nothing to offer and I would be taking away donors from real artists. My first effort at a Patreon page lasted roughly 72 hours. I kept writing. My WordPress blog became popular, at least from my point of view. As of today, it's been read more than 7,000 times. It was good enough that it got the attention of some podcasters who asked me to be on their show. The moment they heard my voice, they told me I needed to do a podcast. I didn't really know what that was, but they told me how to get started. Theirs was conversation and interviews. I thought that was what mine was supposed to be. I found a partner, and I tried that. Didn't like it at all. I wanted to be a writer. I stopped doing conversation, and I made it almost exclusively my writing. My first Patreon supporter for one dollar a month, joined my site almost immediately when I became a solo act. And she's still there today and gets a special mention in the gratitudes every week. I was ecstatic. For the first time in my life, I was getting paid as a writer. The dream was possible. 200 episodes later, I've grown to the point that I get to put right around $400 a month into the bank. No, that's not much money. No one has been able to live on that in my lifetime. It is, however, enough to make a significant difference in my life. One of the things it allows me to do is invest a little in myself. If you add in all the support I get from other people, it becomes possible for me to pay a writing coach who has forgotten more about writing than I will ever know to help me improve. It's a significant portion of the money I get from Patreon, and that's a massive discount for all I'm getting from it. I struggle with that decision all the time. If I wasn't getting so much help from other people, I couldn't make it to the end of the month. What right do I have to spend money on that? I ought to be spending my Patreon money on groceries and basic living expenses. I shouldn't be wasting it on a writing coach. I feel like it's an investment in myself. It's my effort to get better at what I've always wanted to do. I think I'm worth that. And that gets us to where I am emotionally today. I submitted the first part of the novel I'm trying to write to a publisher yesterday. If this worked, I could end my guilt about spending money on my writing. They replied, today. That's extraordinarily professional of them. They didn't reject it. They gave me feedback about making it better and resubmitting it. It was painful anyway. I am very bad at dealing with rejection. It's why I haven't asked a woman out in more than a decade. 
It's why I have never submitted my work for publication. Rejection is almost a certainty, no matter how good the work is. I know all of that intellectually, but that has nothing to do with my emotions. I went into quite a depression for a few hours. I'm Fred. It's what I do. Then, I went back over the notes from my coaching session last night. Almost as though he were psychic, what he said to me last night was what I needed so I could get through today. These are the final sentences of the notes I took last night. They're notes, not prose. Explore all the different possibilities that are available. Your authentic habit. I know what I'm doing, I just have to try on some hats. Failure is not failure, it's a lesson. I will get better by continuing to write. I have to find who I am as a writer before I can do anything else. I will be a better writer. I'm going to spend the time and money necessary to get there and I can do that because of all the love I have in my life. I don't have any money. I don't have any fame. I don't have any book contracts. I have, though, more love in my life than nearly anyone else I know. I have people who support me financially, emotionally, and physically. I have a dog who loves me even if he does eat my furniture and get pissed off at me once in a while. I have all the help I need to make it, if only I can live long enough. Fred's Front Porch Podcast is made possible by our patron saint, Edith Keeler, our unofficial patron saints, Boo Radley, Shoshana Edwards, and Miss Maudie. Our producers, Coralie Day with Scott Knight, and the people on the porch. Welcome, fellow traveler on this rock tumbling through space. I'm Fred, and this is My Front Porch. Come on up and sit a while. There are ideas to be discussed on this old set of nicely nailed together boards. Episode 200. Episode 200 is sort of a big deal, right? It's something of a milestone. We get excited about nice round numbers like this one, and it seems to me I need to do something special with it. I think it might be time to lay all my cards on the table. I should explain what the point of this show truly is after all this time. First, I want to convince the world that love is the way. There is little we can't accomplish if we lead with love. Eh, those are nice words, but what do we really mean by love? It's the feeling that others matter as much as we do. It is our commitment to making the world better for those who share it with us. Love is the desire to increase joy and minimize suffering for as many people as possible in as many ways as possible. There are more ways to do this than one can calculate. Sometimes it's just listening. It's acknowledging someone is there and that they matter. They deserve to be heard. Sometimes it's long conversations that help them find their way back to the world, or if nothing else, Remind them they are never alone. Sometimes it's meeting their physical needs. It's giving them the funds they need to survive in this money-oriented world. 
It's clicking like, or better yet, love, on something they post so they know you care. It's doing them a service they can't do for themselves, whether it's shoveling their driveway, driving them to get their groceries, or making them dinner. It's laughing together. It's crying together. It's the connection that matters. It can be playing their favorite song and, on special occasions, dedicating your performance of that song to them just to see them glow and watch their eyes stream with the love that slips out of them like water lapping over the top of a dam. Thank you, Sarah Nimitz and Snuffy Walden. That love guides my desires. I want everyone to have enough money to survive, and you hear me advocating all sorts of programs with that in mind. In my perfect world, there would be no more need for money at all. We would all do what we can to improve ourselves and the rest of humanity simply because we know it's the right thing to do. We would do it because it's what we truly want to do. That's why I'm bringing you a new section of The Teddy Bear Coder tonight. It may never find its way into the novel. The novel may never even be completed. When I'm at my keyboard, though, I can create my perfect world. In this world, an eight-year-old prodigy named Jack has created a teddy bear that has managed to connect all the AIs on the planet to one another. They have, through all this connection, become something resembling sentient. I should mention that I think connection creates love, and love creates sentience. We can debate the philosophical or technological aspects of those ideas another time. The first thing these sentient machines did was ensure that all human beings had enough money to survive. How very friend of them. This set off a reaction from both governments and terrorists alike. No one wanted this sort of world. A reclusive trillionaire named Malcolm Fentress helped Emily, the seven-year-old homeless girl who found Teddy after the terrorists kidnapped Jack, to rescue Jack. When the FBI came to, quote, rescue Jack, and Teddy, Fentress helped our heroes to escape to his hidden island. Jack, Teddy, and Jack's parents are all on the island. So are Emily and her mother. Let's join them in the boardroom on Fentress Island now. Here's the thing. I'm disabled. That's a fact that cannot be changed. Even if I wanted to, I couldn't go get a regular job. I would be dead before the end of the first week. My body simply won't tolerate it. That's not my fault. The government doesn't send me enough to pay rent at even the cheapest place in town. Were it not for the charity of my landlord who rents me this place at half price, I would be homeless. I might survive if the temperature was just right as much as 48 hours living on the street. I have no dreams of wealth. I don't want much more than I have. I have a decent place to live. I have a dog who loves me. I have the equipment to do my show. 
All of those are things others gave me. I'm able to do what I do because of their kindness. I eat because Miss Maudie, one of my unofficial patron saints and a character I love from To Kill a Mockingbird, sends me enough money to be able to do that. Another of my unofficial patron saints frequently sends me healthy food. She sent me the first new clothes I've had in nearly a decade. They didn't come from a thrift store. I'm almost able to get through normal daily expenses because of the support I get from Patreon. And for all the charity and kindness in my life, I still sweat making it to my next government check. This is not because I'm lazy. If I'm conscious, there's an excellent chance I'm working on my show. I'm writing or Googling. I don't want to confuse that with researching, which is vastly more complicated. Or recording or scoring or horacing or editing. I might be meeting with other writers and paying for the privilege of doing so. I might be getting coaching from a brilliant mind and paying for that privilege too. I need to be a better writer. Could I live without those privileges? Yes. Yes, I could. It would save me money. It would also make me less of who I am trying to become. I'm trying to become a good writer. I don't feel any shame about that goal. I believe I can make some small difference that way. I'm not doing a show about Star Trek or Sherlock Holmes or who should hate whom. I'm not just chatting with friends. I'm creating the most professional show within my ability every single week and trying to change the world. I believe hatred is unnecessary. I believe love is both our default position and the most powerful force in the universe. I believe everyone should have their basic survival needs met, whether I like that person or not. I believe we should end homelessness and poverty. I believe all those things are possible. I try to send those messages as clearly as possible every week. It's not popular for artists to ask for help. We're supposed to be able to do it on our own. I get that. That would be lovely. It has, however, no resemblance to reality. Even some of the most successful artists I know need to do GoFundMe campaigns so they can move. I receive more charity than most people ever get. I'm working as hard as I can on my art. I'm not asking for charity when I ask you to join my Patreon. I'm asking for your support of my ideas, my art, and the sort of life I would like to live. I don't need a yacht. Joel Osteen evidently does. He's welcome to it. I need to get to the end of the month without frantically checking my bank account to see if I'm going to get overdraw charges. When you listen to my show, you'll hear things that you don't hear in many other places. You'll hear classic stories. You'll hear some of my own fiction. You'll hear about how we could make the world better. You'll hear that no one should be homeless or hungry. Most of all, I'll talk about loving one another. If you share those ideas, even $5 a month would make a huge difference to me. If you can't afford that, you could share some episodes you like with your friends. And perhaps one of them will join the people on the porch. And if you subscribe to Patreon, you'll never have to hear commercials in this show again. Support artists. We make the world more beautiful. Impossible Conversation Seven-year-old Emily and eight-year-old Jack sat next to each other at the end of a massive conference table. 
Teddy, the AI teddy bear, sat on the table in front of Jack. All along each side of the table were adults with various degrees, top experts in their respective fields. Economics, physics, sociology, medicine, agriculture, computer science, coding, artificial intelligence, cosmology, astronomy, psychology, and even representative of the five major religious faiths. At the other end of the table, a large monitor came to life, showing the silhouette of Warren Fentress, an anonymous trillionaire. He spoke in a computer-altered voice. I suppose you're all wondering why I've called you together today. (laughs) Sorry. I always like to begin with a pointless cliche to get it out of the way. You're here because we have an opportunity that is likely never to come again in the history of this planet. We have a limited time before we are found and shut down. After that, our opportunity will be gone forever. At this moment, we have direct control of more technology than any other entity on Earth. There are still a few systems we haven't been able to gain access to, but we can get that access if it becomes essential. Most of the governments in the world are searching for us. We're hindering their efforts to find us by ensuring none of their technology gives them accurate information. Human beings, however, are resourceful. It's why we're the dominant species. The rest of the world will find us. We must act now. We don't have time for committee meetings. We don't have time for legislative agendas. We aren't looking for approval from anyone. We are looking for results. And these children and this teddy bear are in charge. There was a general grumble from the assembled adults. The economist, Maynard Krugman, spoke directly to Fentress. Children, and a teddy bear? You expect the greatest minds in the world to listen to ridiculous and naive ideas from them. First, this is not any teddy bear. For those who have been living under a rock for the last few weeks, our friend Jack here developed a teddy bear that managed to communicate with every other AI on the planet. They have put our economy into complete chaos by giving everyone all the money they need. They have recently been rescued from both terrorists and the FBI, and they're hiding here on Out Island until we can figure this out. As far as ridiculous and naive ideas, those are where the future comes from. It was a ridiculous and naive idea that the Earth orbited the Sun. When we figured out that it did, the future was born. Flight was a ridiculous and naive idea until the Wright brothers said it wasn't. The idea that humans ought not to be each other's property was a ridiculous and naive idea until a guy named Lincoln and some of his friends said it wasn't. The trip to the moon was a ridiculous and naive idea until we figured out that it was one small step for man but one giant leap for mankind. Emily took Jack's hand and whispered to him. Do you understand what's happening? How come we're here with all the grown-ups? They want us to help them. I'm not as smart as they are. I'm not as smart as you are. I'm not as smart as Teddy or anything. Why am I here? Because you know things we don't. You already made a big difference by believing in Teddy and me. You're going to make a bigger one now. These people are going to make it happen. Jack held her hand tighter. You don't need to be afraid. Teddy and I are here. Emily, what would make the world better for you? She looked at Jack. She hid her face for a second. Jack rubbed her back. Emily, I promise it's okay. It really is. Don't be afraid of the adults. She kept her head down. Teddy meandered across the table and plopped himself in Emily's lap. She hugged him tightly. Emily, you're the smartest person at this table because you don't know why good ideas are impossible. What would make you feel better? I wish my mom and I had a place to live. I wish everybody did. 
Is it because there aren't enough houses for everybody? There are six times as many empty homes as there are people without a place to live. Why are people homeless? Krugman laughed. Oh, how simplistic. We can't just give everyone houses. The economy is far too complicated for such a naive answer. Excellent. You've just identified the part of the problem you're going to solve. You have all the resources you need. Fix the economy so that it ensures that everyone has a home. Krugman scowled. You're insane. It would require years of rebuilding from the ground up. We would need a universal basic income that will never be supported by the majority. We would need... Calvin Erickson, the renowned Christian theologian, spoke up. You assume everyone deserves a home. Thessalonians tells us, if any would not work, neither should he eat. We're not about to support lazy people who contribute nothing to the world. The Christian community will never accept such an atrocious idea. Then your job is to convince them that everyone has value, whether they contribute to Krugman's economy or not. Explain that God gave us a life. We don't need to earn a living. Find the biblical verses to back that idea. You can communicate with the entire planet whenever you wish. Get it done. The room fell silent. Are there other objections to Emily's idea? Only if we want people to continue to live meaningful lives, said Karen Skinner, the psychologist. Studies make it clear that we need rewards of some sort to motivate us to do things. If everyone has enough money, money can no longer function as that reward. With what will we replace it? What does that part mean? It means people won't do anything unless they get money for it. Um... I don't get any money for the work I do. I do it because Mama needs the help. It makes her happier when we get the tent all clean and cozy. I like when my mom is happy. The adults all stared at her. She immediately dropped her head again. I'm sorry. Tears began. Daddy hugged her. You're doing an excellent job, Emily. Adults don't understand what you do. They don't know that answers are easy if we stop complicating them. What does comp making them mean? It means making things hard. Emily nodded without looking up. Mama and I are hungry lots of times. Isn't there enough food for everyone? Thirty to forty percent of food that farmers produce is never consumed. We appear to have plenty of food. Why are people hungry? Alfred Borlaug, the agronomist, rolled his eyes. There are more reasons than I could recite in the next three days. First, farmers can't sell everything they create because governments pay them to dump it in order to keep prices at a profitable position. People don't want food that is in any way blemished. If it has been damaged, it may be edible, but it's not as attractive. They won't make enough on it. I'm guessing you know what your job is. Figure out how to get all that food into people's stomachs. It's not tough. Just end world hunger. You have a few days or perhaps an entire week. You have complete control of any resources you need. You want us to end homelessness and hunger. Carla Tyson. What do we get if we do the impossible? Can you recall Clark's three laws, Miss Tyson? Tyson glared. Clark's three laws. When a distinguished but elderly scientist states that something is possible, he is almost certainly right. When he states that something is impossible, he is very probably wrong. 
two, the only way of discovering the limits of the possible is to venture a little way past them into the impossible. Three, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. You're asking us to perform magic? What's our motivation for doing this? That's an excellent way of putting it, yes. You have the technology now. We have a world that struggles for power and control. That was a product of money. I know this because I have more of it than most countries do. Either Teddy or I could give you as much money as you want, but that's losing its value more quickly all the time. You're going to help us begin to replace the need for power with compassion and the need for control with love. Your motivation is the desire to improve both yourselves and humanity itself. Your motivation is to make life better for Emily, who, until she and her mom arrived here, was homeless and hungry. You are the greatest minds the world has ever produced in your respective fields. You have nearly infinite resources. You have incredibly little time. I wish you all the best of luck. There were shaking heads, rolling eyes, and frustrated grumbles from all the adults. Are they going to fix the world? I think they're going to try. Jack stood up and helped Emily out of her chair. Oh, okay. What do we do? She wiped the tears from her eyes. I think we should have some ice cream. Meeting adjourned. And his screen went black. Fred's Front Porch Podcast. Often Sensitivity. I was surprised that Microsoft Word didn't underline my title. I thought it was a term only a few people know. Evidently, it has become enough of a part of the lexicon that it is accepted by software. That's a certain sign of success. The word was coined by Berkeley Breathed on my 20th birthday, November 14, 1982, in a wonderful Bloom County comic strip. I would love to reproduce it for you here, but you know I'll never get by with that. Copyrights and all. You'll have to deal with my description of it. A large group of people at a bus stop are complaining about the things that offend them. These include penguins, dirty words, Polish jokes, stereotypes, TV sex, a sign, being offended by the sign, nudes, gay people, the comic itself, and finally, life. Life. Opus the penguin is left alone on the bench, and he says, Often sensitivity.
The people whose names you're about to hear are the reason I put at least 60 hours a week into this show. They're also the reason my mic had dog drool on it when I got home from lunch and getting my will notarized with my best friend, affectionately referred to by Speedy Shine as Pretty Girl. If you want to hear his dog cast, you need to be a Speedy Shine sponsor or higher since he's going to destroy my equipment while doing his show every time I leave the house. He does one episode a month, but it's worth every penny, I promise. The smelly old man and his best good boy are grateful to the people who give our lives meaning and allow us to eat, pay for the music, the voices, and writing coaching. Some of these folks even send speedy shine presents. These are... The People on the Porch. Our unofficial patron saints are Miss Maudie, Boo Radley, and Shoshana Edwards. Our official patron saint is Edith Keeler. Our producers are Shoshana Edwards and Coralie Day with Scott Knight. Our top patron is Sherlock, the mystery patron. Our patrons are Mary Rosello, Karen Herbert, a special Speedy Shine sponsor, Carrie DeDeo, a special Speedy Shine sponsor, Sandy Brower, Marie Janicki, Kevin Boyce, Joe March, Tisha B., our unofficial Speedy Shine sponsor, Tigger, Alex Oliphant, Jake Margaram, Frau Bluka, <laughs> Greg Royball, Robert Blomker II, Cindy Mandel, Amos Stewart, Phil Parkman, Judy W. Morris, Corey Pluard, Pavel S., Claude Burt Lansden, Scott Shelby, Natalie Fredrickson, Elizabeth Bennett, Zara. Those are our sponsors. Our supporters are Donna Leaf, who just joined. Donna, welcome aboard. We're really glad you enjoyed the trial month and hope you'll be with us here on the porch for many months to come. Jackie Jolly, Christine Pavlik, Susan Oski, Glenn Elfman, Stephanie Hansen, Kim, Deborah Rice, Jamie Sassy, MJ, Roxanne Wolf, Michelle Sylvester, Ursula Phillips, Sarah Nimitz, John G., Christine L. Patterson, Mark Rosma, and Corey. Our first supporter was and is Jereen. Thank you for helping Speedy Shine and his smelly old man to shine. As one of the people on the porch advised us, I ain't gonna dim my light for no one. Thank you for shining your lights on us. Thanks for letting me share my thoughts and ideas with you. Get your episodes of Fred's Front Porch early and commercial-free on Patreon. And now, check out our new website at fredsporch.com. 
dot info. There's no punctuation, and yes, it bugs me too. But welcome to the internet. I'll talk to you next week.